So thanks for joining our third webinar in this Autism Speaker Series, and it's called Expanding the Dialogue on Autism, Reflections on Research in Real Life and Community Life Engagement. And I'm Katie Allen from the Institute for Community Inclusion at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And we're hosting these discussions as part of our 50th anniversary celebration, and because we're committed to expanding the discussion around autism and developmental disabilities. So it looks like um, most people right now, our agency staff have responded to the poll. I think we can probably close the poll and I'll go over some rules about Zoom, which is the webinar platform we're using right now. So just some hints about Zoom. Um, as participants, you are automatically muted and you're not on camera right now. So don't worry about finding the mute button because you don't need to, you're already muted. Um, but you can communicate during the webinar using the chat box feature, which if you go to the bottom of your screen and hover your mouse over the black bar on the bottom of your screen will appear. And there is a chat icon there. And if you click on that chat icon, um, you can communicate and ask your questions and comments during the presentation by uh, typing them there. And just um, very important to be aware of, while you're typing your questions, you want to make sure that you're responding to all panelists and attendees. So there's a little blue drop down menu next to the word to in your chat box and it probably says all panelists that you want to drop down, make sure it says all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your comments and questions today. And um, I see somebody asked about the first two webinars. They are archived and we can send the link to that uh, page where you can watch the previous webinars on employment and education. And tomorrow, um, the day after today, after this webinar, you'll receive a link to the webinar evaluation. And if you are a certified rehabilitation counselor looking to um, get CRC credits for attending, you can take this webinar evaluation. And it might take a few weeks to get your credits, but um, even if you're not a CRC, we just encourage you to take the webinar evaluation and let us know how, what you thought. So I'm going to um, just introduce our host today. Tom Sanacondro is our host today. He's the director of the Institute for Community Inclusion and Tom's gonna to talk a little bit about why we chose this topic. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, and thank you everybody who's joined us today, welcome. Um, this online speaker series is part of our 50th anniversary celebration of the Institute for Community Inclusion. And we thought a good way to celebrate would be to have an educational speaker series that would be informative as well as to showcase the expertise of the ICI. This series will be a chance for us to get beyond common stereotypes around autism and to open up a much richer conversation. Uh, today, our panelists will be discussing issues around community engagement and autism. Take it away, Katie. So I'm just going to introduce our panelists to you today. Um, first, and I'm going in alphabetical order here. First, we have Finn Gardner. And Finn is a community educator, researcher, advocate, and designer. And Finn is a Master of Public Policy student at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Finn currently works with the Lurie Institute for Disability Policy at Brandeis University and the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, or ASAN. At Lurie and ASAN, Finn combines disability advocacy, policy analysis, and visual and written communication to help advance the rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our next panelist um, is unable to join today, but his name was Russell Lehman, and he did join for our preparation, so he hopefully might join at some point during the presentation, and if so, we can introduce him at that time. Um, our third panelist is Stacy Ramirez. Stacy is the executive director of the ARC in Georgia. Ms. Ramirez is a proud supporter of People First, chair of the local American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, which is AAIDD chapter, an advisory board member for the crisis intervention team, training to educate first responders in interactions with people with mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities, and a member of the Autism Advisory Council to the Department of Developmental Disabilities for the development of supports and services for adults on the autism spectrum. Stacy is also a proud mother of three sons, including a son who has autism and who's a strong advocate for community inclusion. Our fourth presenter is Dr. Jennifer Seleski from the Institute for Community Inclusion. 
Dr. Slesky is a senior research associate at the ICI, and she's based her research career in large part on investigating community life engagement for people with developmental disabilities. Dr. Slesky recently conducted a study on how to improve supports for community life engagement. She conducted her doctoral research on non-work day supports and has authored numerous publications and conference presentations on community life engagement. She received her PhD in social policy from Brandeis University in 2006 with a dissertation titled In Search of Meaningful Daytimes, Community-Based Non-Work Supports for Adults with Developmental Disabilities. And last but not least, our final presenter is Lauren Weaver. Lauren works as a board certified behavioral analyst in pediatrics and a coordinator of community engagement for Vanderbilt's Kennedy Center Treatment and Research Institute for Autism Spectrum Disorders, which is also called Triad in Nashville, Tennessee. And Lauren coordinates Triad's community engagement program, including the Inclusion Network of Nashville, innovative partnerships to create a community network of arts, education, athletic, and entertainment organizations that works to promote full inclusion of children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, autism, and other developmental disabilities, and their families. So I'm going to turn it back over to Tom to start the questions for panelists. Great. Thank you very much, Katie, and thank you panelists for being part of this discussion today. Um, first, what I want to do is start off. This is um, a relatively new term that's being used today, community life engagement. So first of all, let's take a few minutes to unpack the concept of community life engagement. Um, this is a relatively new area of research and study. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what this means. What is community life engagement and how is it different from simply living in the community rather than in a segregated setting? Um, why don't we start this with Jen Selesky? Jen? Sure, thanks, Tom. So community life engagement is the term that we've been using to talk about people's ways of engaging in their community outside of the paid work setting. So the previous webinar was on integrated employment, and this is really the parallel of integrated community engagement. It really encompasses everything that people do to engage in community life outside of their work hours, whether that volunteer work, fitness, socializing, um, being part of a religious community, anything that, that you and I do really, and anybody does, to make their life more full in addition to their paid work. And uh, what I'm gonna do is at least in the beginning is to call on the panelists. Um, and if you really get excited over some of these issues and you wanna um, break in and um, interact with each other, that would be great. It can make for a lively conversation. But at least from the beginning, I will start um, on calling on folks. And now, uh, Lauren, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, we're, uh, we're working on this community life engagement here in Nashville. And it's, it's, it has expanded beyond Nashville quickly just from our work with our community partners. Um, but I'll be speaking a lot today about our work in Nashville as a community focusing on this community life engagement and what, uh, what, ha what can the community do to support this type of work. Um, and so uh, we have started at Triad the Inclusion Network of Nashville, which includes 26 organizations, 18 uh, community organizations like the zoo, our botanical gardens, the ballet, um, some athletic are, are the Nashville Predators, the Nashville Sounds, which is a minor league baseball team. So all of these things that people in our community go and do when they're not being paid, right, during this, uh, during this time. And so um, in partnership with other disability focus groups, um, we're working together to identify how can we increase awareness, but beyond awareness, acceptance and inclusion into our community through these great things that, that we have to offer here in Nashville. Great, thank you. Um, Finn, do you want to weigh in on how you term uh, or what you think the definition is of community life engagement and why that's important? Uh, you got to get your um, mute off, turn the mute off. Whoops, well, um, to define it most simply, um, community life engagement is the recognition that 
people with disabilities deserve the right to participate equally in the community as much as anybody else does because they have inherent human value, because they are people, because they um, should not be segregated from others just because they have a disability. To do so is incredibly dehumanizing and unfair and kind of harks back to the um, kind of sordid history that um, has sort of permeated um, like attitudes in this country towards people with disabilities. And from a policy perspective, it's important to um, support and implement programs that advocate for community um, community engagement and um, and either dismantle or um, reform laws, statutes, regulations that are rooted in the idea that people with disabilities do not deserve to participate equally in society. Um, for example, there are still laws on the books about um, paying people with disabilities sub-minimum wage that have not been repealed. They are still law. It is still federal law that people with disabilities may not, um, if their work is considered not productive enough, they can be paid less than minimum wage and work in segregated settings in which they only interact with people with the same disability and do not receive real wages. They do not participate in the community. And issues like this are one of the primary reasons why it is absolutely imperative to shift the conversation from we're going to take care of people with disabilities to we're going to ensure that people with disabilities are equal participants in society at large. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, Stacy. do you want to weigh in on this yourself? I don't know that we could say anything better than what Finn <laughs> just eloquently said. What I was reflecting on is how, how our language evolves. Um, when my, my guys were little, I think we would have called it informal supports and, and I'm getting the same vibe as, as some of the informal supports that when Ryan was young, we would, we would utilize. So it's just being involved in the community when he would want to play soccer, we would go play soccer and some of his friends would be, um, uh, having hippotherapy when we would go horseback riding. Um, so it, it's just like Finn said so eloquently, it's being involved in the community in an authentic way, but with the proper support. So I'm excited to get um, in depth with some of the other questions that have been put together to help us build on what this really means and, and how we make it happen. Great. Right. Why don't I stay with you, Stacy, and let's talk about what are some of the challenges that people on the spectrum face in terms of fully engaging with their community since you've sort of started to begin with that. So why don't you move on on that concept? Right. And, and please understand, I'm talking a lot from my personal views in supporting Ryan. Um, I have three boys, as, as was told but my middle son, who's now 24, has fought his way into community his entire life. And some of the roadblocks, I will just dive deep with the criminal justice system and um, just the culture of the criminal justice system and the culture of autism not understanding each other. Um, there's a lot of education to start there, and, and that is one of my primary um, policies and projects that I'm taking on around Georgia um, as we speak. Great. Um, Finn, are you, do you, are you ready to discuss that? You seem like you were about ready to jump in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure um, well um, I was going to say that um, for um, people in the spectrum, community engagement is um, particularly important because there is often this pervasive stereotype that uh, autistic people can't engage with community, that they are uh, like completely empty shells, that they can't meaningfully interact with others. This is false. Um, while it may be difficult for autistic people to communicate with non-autistic people, this isn't because um, of an intrinsic flaw within the autistic person. It's more it's more bi-directional. Neither person on either side 
quite understands how the other communicates in some cases. Of course, there can be ways the gap can be bridged, but it's an initial problem. And moreover, um, I think that autistic people should be enga um, engaged in the community because it's the right thing to do. And because community engagement is connected with other positive life outcomes like employment or um, engagement in um, activities that are meaningful and higher education and other opportunities that they would not have otherwise received if they were um, segregated and excluded from the rest of the community. Um, for example, um, in my own case, um, I myself am on the spectrum and um, I am highly engaged in the community. Um, I live mostly independently, etc. And I kind of attribute that to um, encountering people who I'm um, encountering people in my life um, who believed that I was able to participate in the community and didn't think that I should be institutionalized or that I should be in a sheltered workshop earning sub minimum wage. And I think that like on principle and like, on principle and just like based on the evidence, it is absolutely vital that autistic people be engaged in the community because um, the um, unemployment rate um, for autistic people, whether or not they have an intellectual disability, is dramatically higher than it is for other people with disabilities, even if they have, an, for example, an autistic person without an intellectual disability is still more likely to be unemployed than somebody with an intellectual disability who is not autistic, who may have something else like Down syndrome. And I attribute a lot of this to this attitude um, among some people who work with autistic people that if you're autistic, you cannot engage with the community, you are an empty shell, you, um, they, you, they just in, internalize a lot of these dehumanizing ideas. I feel like that is um, extremely detrimental to people's outcomes. Um, Lauren, are you ready to weigh in on that one? Yes, I'd like to kind of extend on something that Finn mentioned about this kind of um, conversation between the autism community and the non-autistic community. Um, and in my experience in working with community organizations, we reach out and say, we wanna help you increase and build on what you're already doing. And um, the response has, has been 100%, we've never reached out to an organization and they said, no, we're not interested in this because it's the right thing to do because, um, but it is this, Know, they're not sure how to support engagement, community engagement. And so that's something that we're helping or trying to help break the barrier of, there is this community, there, you know, autism um, that have unique needs. And so increasing awareness in our community about what autism really is and not just the few stories you hear through the media about the one person with autism because it is the spectrum disorder Let's disseminate the information about the whole spectrum and what some of those resources are that can help increase community engagement for this population. Great. And Jen, do you want to weigh in on that as well? And um, Yeah, sure. So I think, people Go ahead. Sorry. So um, I can sort of build on what both um, Lauren and Finn were saying as far as a lot of what I look at as a researcher is how service systems for people with developmental disabilities are supporting or not supporting community engagement. And as Finn mentioned, we have in the past and still do to some extent have people in institutional settings. It's still pretty prevalent to have people in segregated settings during the day, such as a sheltered workshop where a group of people with disabilities are working together or um, a day program that groups people with disabilities. And so there's, there's definitely a push to get people out of those settings, but just as Lauren said, people in the community aren't sure how to support and integrate people with disabilities. Even people in the disability service system struggle with, with how to do that because we have this shift away from those segregated or grouped services. And how do you take what you've done in your career as someone who's worked in a segregated setting and shift that to supporting people to be out in the community more. So what we find is that even programs that are um, intended to be community-based, intended to promote community integration, don't necessarily always succeed because there's still that struggle to figure out how to really support meaningful engagement. 
Great. Um, how can communities be inclusive and welcoming to individuals on the spectrum? What can a community do to increase accessibility for all people with autism? And Stacy, it sounds like you've been working in that area yourself, so. Um... Quite a bit. Um, I think it goes with the other, other area. I, you know, I, I led with working with the, the police or, or first responders. The other area I work is person-centered planning and focusing on people's gifts and capacities. So once you slow down and you realize the gift and capacity that a, a person brings to their community and you make space for that gift to be shared, there becomes a reci uh, reciprocity um, in the community. And once you establish the reciprocity, then you have you you build true community is what I've seen when I've supported uh, people with autism, specifically adults with autism, to, to find their way um, in, in the way that they would want to, to be in community. And, and I know that we'll talk about that more. But it's that I support the person with autism and specifically this, this weekend, I'm, I'm working with someone to do something called a MAPS conversation to help them lay out an action plan of what it is they want to accomplish and and how to get there and establish a circle of support around them that will keep them on the right path and, and help them achieve those goals. Great. And um, Lauren, do you want to talk about um, preparing communities um, or how communities can be more inclusive for people with autism? Yes, um, so what we've focused on um, is uh, providing having uh, providing support so that the community organizations create social stories. So as we know with autism, um, there is the deficit, de deficit area of communication that might be expressive or um, receptive, but either way, in order to have autism, there has to be some sort of a communication deficit. Um, and so what we've focused on is providing um, support to the two organizations um, so that we can have social stories or visual schedules that really describe what it's going to be like and what to expect when you do go and visit these different community organizations. Um, because of the communication deficit areas, um, we can see increased anxiety levels um, because it's something new. You don't go to the zoo or to the ballet or to the performing arts center every day. It's something new. And so what can you expect when you go to these um, organizations. And what we found by having those is that it encourages individuals and their families to try it out. Families have this choice. They can stay at home where it's a bit safer um, or they can try it out. Go to the community and see what it's like. And what we found is that not all families are using these supports, but the ones who are finding that they're having increased independence and success and enjoyment in the community. The ones who finding that they aren't needing it as much is that, oh, hey, I went out to the opera and uh, the supports were there and it was great, but I can come back any day that we don't have to have these special sensory friendly or autism awareness days to go into the community. But our goal is building capacity so that every day is autism awareness day and every day an individual or a family can use supports that are available um, that tell you what to expect when you go to the community and um, go enjoy all of the great things that everyone else gets to. Great. Jen, do you want to weigh in on that? I think uh, Lauren said it really well. There was one uh, particular tool that I wanted to just point out that actually comes from, from Vanderbilt, from Eric Carter, who works there on the Tennessee Works program. And they've been doing something called Community Conversations. And they've used it as a, a tool for connecting people with employment opportunities, but I think it's potentially a really powerful tool for connecting people with other aspects of their local communities too. And what these are is, is very local conversations with people with disabilities, people from the, their families in the disability service system, but more importantly, people just from the local community on a very hyper local level, talking about how can we engage youth and adults with disabilities more in our community and just giving 
people with disabilities that voice and talking about that. So I think that's really um, one potential sort of concrete tool if there are people that are listening that work in service provider agencies or something might consider pursuing something like that. Great. And Finn, do you want to weigh in on that? There are so many ways that um, community agencies can be um, led to include autistic people. Um, some of the things I was thinking about were, um, I um, remember hearing something about criminal justice being mentioned and um, issues around first responders. Um, autistic people, like other people with disabilities, are at um, an increased risk of incurring police violence, especially if they are um, people of color, if they're like black or Latino. And these disproportionalities, um, they intersect. It's like the intersection between racism and ableism and other um, embedded forms of social stigma. And in order to kind of redress those problems that stem from that stigma, it's important to um, train officers in de-escalation techniques and you know talk about things talk be very frank about talking about things like racial disproportionality and um disproportionate um interactions with the um criminal justice justice system um <laughs> there um i would um look into the work of people like um, tl lewis and um david perry they've done a lot of work around um disability and um, criminal justice. And I think that um, another way that um, the community or community organizations can work with autistic people is you know, simply ask them what they want. Like, like conduct surveys, do qualitative research, conduct interviews, ask people what they want and what they need and what they're struggling with. I think that um, using firsthand perspectives is incredibly vital in engaging a community. Um, there's often this pervasive idea that, um, especially around autism, more so than other disabilities, that the conversation about it must be directed by people who do not have a disability, but our parents, our researchers, our professionals. And while those perspectives are, of course, important, um, um, people with firsthand experience may have in may will have insight into um, what they need and you know what their challenges are and what their benefit and what they benefit from and you know adhering to this idea that autistic people can't speak for themselves plays into this whole idea of systemic ableism where there is this constant disenfranchisement of um people with disabilities and that again, kind of harks back to what I said earlier about deeply embedded toxic cultural mythologies that are sort of pervasive. And it's important as members of the community, as professionals, as researchers, as parents, et cetera, to question those assumptions, to pay attention to the, um, pay attention to these, um, you know, toxic presumptions and, sort of out, um, uproot them from your thinking so that you can like meaningfully engage, help autistic people engage the community and vice versa in, in a substantive way. Right. Um, Jen, why don't we start with you? What are some innovative strategies you've seen in action that have helped people on the spectrum to engage in their community or to engage in community living? If there's a difference with that. So I'm going to preface what I say here by saying, by pointing out that a lot of my, as I said, I do a lot of research on service systems. And so I want to acknowledge that that people in the service system does not by any means encompass the full spectrum of people with autism. A lot of people with autism for one reason or another either don't qualify for or don't choose to access developmental disability services or vocational rehabilitation. So some of what I say, it isn't going to apply to everybody, but, um, but some of the things, um, so going back to what was your question again, it was what can... Services what, what strategies have you seen that, that um, have helped someone on the spectrum be mm -hmm. successful? The first question was more, what can communities do to right. um, be better 
able to um, include people. And this is strategies for people um, on the spectrum, um, ways to prepare them better for um, engagement in the community. Well, one of the things that we've seen in our case studies of service providers that do a good job of engaging people in the community is really the importance of reframing the role of the staff that work directly with people with developmental disabilities away from sort of a caretaker role or a keeping people safe role towards more of a facilitator role. So really thinking about um, what is there, so what are the ways that the ways we're already doing things uh, provide barriers to engagement. So for example, if people are going out in groups with a staff person, that makes them less approachable. So are there ways that people can be supported to be out in the community in a smaller group or, or on their own? And also staff thinking about when they can step back or make an introduction and then try to sort of fade back and facilitate the individual with a disability, making a connection with people in their, in their setting. So for example, if someone is taking a yoga class at the gym, maybe the staff person doesn't need to come and be right next to them doing yoga at all times. Maybe they can come the first couple times, get them acclimated to the setting, maybe make a couple introductions or, or help them think about how to approach others in the class and then maybe they wait in the lobby the next time and let the person integrate a little more naturally in the setting on their own. Stacy, do you want to um, weigh in on this one? Yes. Oh, I'm unmuted. Shame on me. I was not following instructions. Imagine that. Um, so I'm looking down at the different questions and I wanted to make sure that I've, I've got this right. So we're looking at innovative strategies that I've seen in action that has helped someone on the spectrum to engage in community living. And um, I think the most powerful thing that I have seen in action was just the effective use of positive behavior supports. It, and when I use that, that term, it's not so much the, the understanding or the, the ABA of positive behavior supports, but when you go from um, understand, prevent, and then that replace part of positive behavior supports, and you give the person who is having the issue communicating in an effective way um, tools and strategies to say it a different way. If I don't want to do my homework, throwing a chair through a window might not be the most effective way of saying I don't want to do it. So giving a different way of communicating that has, um, well, uh, going back to my own life, it's changed my life. But in working with others on that, once you understand the behavior is communication, you work with um, researchers as those brilliant minds we have on the call with us today or on the webinar with us today. Um, you, and then you replace it, meaning you give the person a different way of communicating that the community can understand in an effective way. That has been a powerful strategy that I as a lay person didn't understand until I saw it in action. Great. Lauren, do you want to expound on that concept or? Yes, I think that's a, a, a misconception is that challenging behavior or, or when you behave or respond differently than what people expect is attributed to something other than a communication deficit. And really that we're engaging in when, when we see people who are engaging differently, it's it's all about communication. They're trying to communicate a need or an interest. And so Stacy, I really, I, I agree. And, um, I think it's great to emphasize that this is a, a way to communicate and if we can help support people to learn a way to communicate that will be responded to more universally, then we're going to have more um, uh, more effective inclusion in the community. And then the other thing I wanted to, to add is that 
inclusion um, in the community doesn't have to look the same for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that the way that you enjoy something isn't the same that the way that another person, autism or not, is going to enjoy something. Um, and so I've, I've had this experience working with families where they say, my son loves going to baseball, but waiting in line or waiting for the game to start is really hard. And so we can't go. Um, and so we suggest going in the third inning and you still get to enjoy the baseball. Um, you know, some people can't stand to leave in the eighth inning or before all, you know, until the game is over, but that's, that's not the same for everyone. And I, my daughter has taught me this as well. We're 10 minutes into fireworks and she's ready to go. Um, but I want to see the finale, but that's not important to her. So again, just inclusion, the way we enjoy things in the community is not the same for everyone. Great. Great. I and think that's really a really important point. Um, and that's something that we've, really emphasized a lot in the guidepost for community life engagement supports that have come out of our research is just how much it has to be based on the individual and what their preferences are, what their interests are, what they're comfortable with. That's really the most important thing. Great. Finn, do you want to weigh in? All right. Um, so I think that one of the important things to do in this case is number one, to ask people again, like, what are they having difficulty with? What do they need? And of course, um, as you said, Lauren, um, when people exhibit challenging behaviors, it's often um, a um, it's often an expression of like trying to communicate something, but you don't have the words to communicate it, or you are so overloaded that you you're having a hard time doing. And I think that some things that might help autistic people adapt to the community, for example, might be. Um, doing things like sort of preparing people for an event beforehand, using things like scripts, like communication scripts to understand like, like this is how you talk to the, the pharmacist. This is how you might want to ask the teacher for an, an, an extension. This is how you might want to ask for something in a restaurant. Um, another strategy you might be able to use is like teaching, teaching um, things like self-regulation techniques. If you can feel yourself about to have a meltdown or, you know, exhibit other um, expressions of frustration or discomfort that might be that might seem challenging to somebody else who, that might look disruptive but aren't intentionally disruptive or challenging um, for example you might as I said like teach um, de-escalation techniques or calming techniques or like kind of remove yourself from the situation if you can and then come back when you can um, and come back once you calm down and an important thing in um, helping autistic people adapt to potentially challenging or overwhelming situations in the communities to recognize that um, you should not use a punitive approach. Um, when I was younger, I frequently encountered people who would use a punitive um, approach with me. And it took me years to realize exactly what was going on. And you know, I wasn't able to get the help I needed because while, they, while I had a diagnosis, I was actually diagnosed very early, um, people would interpret um, my meltdowns that would happen in class and in other situations and other places as being deliberately disruptive, as though they were calculated behavior, as though they were things that um, you know I wanted to do, but they weren't. They were expressions of overloading frustration after feeling bombarded with sensory stimuli or people being rude to me or being bullied in class for whatever reason. Um, I think that understanding that the um, autistic people do have interiority and that you cannot just see the behavior and react to it as a surface phenomenon when helping autistic people adapt to the community. Um, also, I think that it's important to have things like comprehensive training for things like job searching, dealing with things like taxes and other adult responsibilities. Fairly early, like I'm talking early teens, early adolescence, as opposed to your 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, you're about to age out of the system. Now we're going to teach you. That's too late. Um, it Because people are going to end up learning the hard way or not learning it at all and ending up in a situation they don't want to be, be in because they don't have that training. And by training, I sort of mean a comprehensive program in which the desires and wishes of the um, autistic person are recognized and taken into account. It's not, we are going to sit here and teach you how to be a normal person. That's not helpful. It's more, we, um, as you said earlier, Jen, it's about being a facilitator, about leading people 
and helping them adapt to their environment in the best way they can, um, pursuing their own goals, whether that be higher education or joining the workforce directly or a combination of the two. Um, also, it's important to recognize that, again, being autistic is on a spectrum. We are not all the same. And for example, um, we do not all have an intellectual disability. I don't have an intellectual disability. There are plenty of other autistic people who don't have an intellectual disability. Um, but there are plenty of people who do, and the needs of people with different learning abilities may vary. People of different races, social classes, genders, etc., may also have experiences that intersect with their disability. And I think it's important to see an autistic person in a holistic way. I mean, obviously, I mean, I use identity first language autistic person as opposed to person with autism because I don't think my autism is separated separated from me, separated from me in the same way. Like I can't, I, I'm also not a person with blackness. But um, I, um, but even within that, I think that's important as, as I said, to see, to see somebody as a holistic human being, like as a holistic human being with interests and, you know, interiority as opposed to, you are a list of deficits as though you're a government budget or something. That's not how it works. Um, I'm gonna, um... Now shift a little bit, but when we're talking about, there was some conversation even early on, when we talked about community engagement, we also talked about the sort of full engagement in the community. And we also, that in a few of you on the panel had talked about um, the issue of employment as well. So I, I think I want to start with, um, with um, uh, Finn and talk about this is one of the things you um, had mentioned is let's talk about volunteering and unpaid work and volunteering as we know can be a great way to engage with the community um, but there's also a danger uh, particularly for people with disabilities to get locked into that unpaid role can you talk a little bit about that tension and um, how you have seen folks with um, autism have navigated that role? Okay, well, I can only really speak for myself and from things that I've observed, but um, generally speaking, volunteering is a good thing to do when it's something that you're personally interested in and are in a sort of approach autonomously. Like, I did a lot of volunteering as a teacher. Like, I would tutor kids in foreign languages. I would, um, you know, I help teach Sunday school, et cetera, I um, was involved in several activities like this, but they were, there were things that I was interested in and approached autonomously. They were not treated as a substitute for work. I didn't approach them as a substitute for work. But unfortunately, a lot of people will say, you should volunteer as a way to occupy your time. The, um, the emphasis is not on engaging in an activity that you find meaningful that you would gladly do without pay because you care about the cause but um, it's about taking up somebody's time just to be productive. And I think, you know, recognizing that distinction may help people um, sort of move away from using volunteering as a means to just occupy people's time. Um, I think that it's um, vastly more helpful to um, have autistic people who are struggling to find work or who may need additional supports and work to find opportunities to find um, programs that um, help them get um, competitive and integrated employment as opposed to volunteering because they need to take up their time and they would rather not sit around in a day program. Um, the same goes for pushing people, the same goes for um, steering people into like sub minimum wage jobs, sub minimum wage jobs. The same principle applies, um, though instead of getting nothing, they're getting peanuts for their work. Again, it's important to direct people towards services that um, allow them to prepare them to do work that they are work that they find meaningful, work that pays them a living wage, work that allows them to engage meaningfully in the community, as opposed to, hey, you have a disability, we're going to set you over here and sort of sequester you away from the rest of society. Um, that is something that I find truly appalling that 
people think that you should just sort of shove people with disabilities away from the rest of society and have them just kind of languish there without engaging meaningfully in the community. And I think that it is imperative for people who work with autistic people to sort of get those job skills, like get train people for job skills early on and have them engage with people who know how to help people find jobs, like how to do a resume, how to write a cover letter, how to pass an interview, how to do all these things and how to present themselves in the best light and how to you know, develop their talents as opposed to going, you know what, you have a disability, you can't work, you are just gonna go on social security um, and we're gonna stick you in a day program or you're gonna volunteer and like kind of have this sort of token position or we're gonna have you work at this thrift store that pays you some minimum wage. I think that it's, um, you have to recognize that in order to achieve actual equity, you need to engage in equitable practices that like fully integrate the person. Jen, do you wanna weigh in on the research on that and what you've seen in the field and that area? Yeah, I definitely, thank you so much for bringing that up, Ben, because I think that's just a really important point. And that's something that we are always trying to emphasize. I think it's one of the pitfalls in the service system is the tendency to think of people in as doing sort of one thing or another. So community life engagement is something that you do instead of employment. And we always try to emphasize that it, it's something you do in addition to employment. You might do volunteer work while you're looking for a job to sort of keep out in the community and be networking and keeping your skills current. You might do it on the side because there's something you're interested in that isn't part of your paid job. You might do it when you're retired, but you don't volunteer or engage in the community instead of finding a job. So we always talk about community life engagement in the employment first context. So let's keep in mind that the sort of normative role for adults is to have a paid job. That's what people do, especially in this society. And we should really be encouraging people to pursue paid employment at full wages alongside people without disabilities and thinking about community life engagement as something that then complements that. Great. And Lauren, do you uh, want to weigh in on that as well? Um, just kind of building on what the other panelists have said is is that um, you can't you don't have time to volunteer at all the places that you may want to be involved in the community. And so having a paid employment will give you opportunities to engage more with the community because it, it costs money to go to uh, you know, be involved, go to the opera or go to a performing arts. Um, and so having employed work opens up that opportunity for additional community life engagement. Um, thank you. Um, we're gonna shift so now. And one more, oh, sorry. Absolutely, no, Jen, <laughs> one more I wanna thing hear. on that, that um, I think it's worth saying for sort of the people that are in the service provider audiences that um, it's important to keep in mind that there are rules around what people can and can't do as volunteer work and so making sure that people with disabilities aren't volunteering doing things that should be paid work i've seen this happen um before and it's definitely it, it's not legal <laughs> and it's not the right thing to do so making sure that volunteer work is, is really something that people without disabilities would do on a volunteer basis too Thank you. Thanks for adding that and clarifying that. I think that's an important point, Jen. Um, what I'm going to do now is we're going to shift and we're going to begin um, to take audience questions. Um, so we're going to, uh, the first one, and I'm going to have to read these because they're a little complex. Um, do you have suggestions on any existing programs or agencies or methods that successfully include individuals with autism, autistic individuals, to be meaningfully included in culturally diverse communities who still have different myths about autism and families from these communities are still facing the social stigma of having a child with autism. I don't know if I made that clear enough in the... Uh, does anybody want to jump in with that? I guess the, um, when we talk about community engagement, being included in culturally diverse communities and 
challenges around that side and what you've seen or what you've experienced or what the research tells us. Anybody ready to jump in on that one? I'll jump in. Go um, ahead, Finn. Okay, so yeah, this is a highly complex and important issue um, and something that resonates personally as somebody who is autistic and is also, you know, a person of color. And um, I think that it's important, number one, for um, professionals and researchers and parents to connect with people from diverse communities who may be on the spectrum. For example, there are a ton of um, autistic activists um, and advocates who are also people of color, who are also you know, Black or East Asian or um, um, Latino or Latina, Native American, et cetera. Um, for example, there um, was an anthology published last year. Um, I actually contributed to it. Um, it's called All the Weight of Our Dreams, and um, it is an entire anthology written, um, containing first-hand narratives from autistic people of color. It's, um, so that might be a good um, resource to start off with. And um, there are, there are um, I can also share some of the um, names and resources with you within the chat. So it's important to connect and find out about what people are going through and talk to people with first-hand experience of that disability and of being in a more, um, being in like diverse ethnic communities so you can understand exactly or at least have a more intimate understanding of what the situation is as opposed to going, we are going to engage with this community and not talk to anybody with firsthand experience. That's not how it works. Um, I also think that um, some of these issues, the difficulties with connecting with um, people of color and um, like people in other ethnic minor minorities may come from also the um, differential diagnosis rates. For example, um, white people are more likely to receive autism diagnoses than are black people and black people are in turn more likely to get these diagnoses than um, La, um, Latino or Latina people, and um, some of that is, you know, related to differenti um, differential um, access to healthcare, differential access to school psychologists and other professionals that may be able to diagnose them. There's off there's often a lot of misdiagnosis um, for Black and um, La, um, Latino and Latina people, for example, like people being labeled with oppositional defiant disorder or other conditions as opposed to autism, whereas um, white children are more likely to be identified correctly at the beginning. Um, and that problem is even more pervasive with adults who, if they were born before a certain period, they're highly unlikely to be diagnosed and may not know why they're having difficulties. Um, also, there is this, also I think it's important to, of, um, when working with autistic people of color to avoid um, engaging in stereotypes that are both racist and ableist, like um, underestimating the um, intelligence or other abilities of um, autistic people of color. Because there's, there's often this idea that, oh, you know, black, like, on the, you already have the association with autism and um, not being able to learn well or understand the world well. And that we all have an intellectual disability. No, we don't. That there are people who do, but um, that is not the case for everyone. Moreover, people with an intellectual disability are capable of learning. It may take them a little bit longer, but that doesn't mean they can't learn. And um, but there's all, and there's also this pervasive racial stereotype that like, oh, black people are less intelligent than white people, or like Latinos are less intelligent than white people. And I think that both of these stereotypes can intersect like, oh, you're black and you have this disability, you must not know anything. Um, and I've been personally underestimated because um, you know, I believe both my race and my disability. And um, I think that it's important to, again, as I said earlier, kind of uproot those ideas from your mind, kind of question, why are you thinking this way? Why are you allowing these stereotypes to determine the way you treat people? Anyone else um, want to weigh in on that one? Um, I, we also have a question from Jamie, and it's the question is, 
What about assisting with peer development mentoring and working towards increasing communication kit skills instead of asking businesses and community agencies to change the way change the way they output information? Do I need to repeat that? I know I get a little is anybody ready to talk about that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll go, go ahead, ahead and respond to that. I think that, Jamie, I think that is also incredibly important to help individuals access um, therapies or um, ways to learn new skills to help them access community life engagement, access the community. Um, but I don't think that it's all the individual's responsibility. I think that as a community, we also need to identify ways to increase accessibility um, and inclusion for individuals. So it's a, it's a two way street. We shouldn't expect the community to make all the modifications uh, that I don't know that that's possible. Although we're going to, we're going to try for it. We're going to shoot for it, shoot for the moon. Um, but it's, it's both ways. The community should in the way that we have laws around accessibility for physical disabilities, there aren't laws in place yet for developmental or to my knowledge, maybe Finn can, can correct me, but there aren't laws in place for, um, supports or uh, modifications for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I think that's an area that hopefully we'll see grow soon, sooner rather than later. Um, so it's a two way street. Um, what do you mean by modifications not being in place? Because like the ADA would. Well, but, but specifically supports that can help an individual with um, a communication, you know, a, an intellectual or developmental disability. So whether if there's, um, a communication deficit that we know that their research has shown that by having a social story or visual schedule or another way to communicate what to expect is beneficial for someone with an intellectual and developmental disability. There's nothing in the law that says that you a community organization has to provide that. Yeah, it's not as specific. I mean, and things like communication devices, those would have to be covered by insurance or Medicaid, etc. Um, yeah, like as far as I know, um, I haven't seen anything specific, but um, there may be an argument that you could consider um, a reasonable accommodation under the ADA, depending on the organization. Like every organization has its own policies and priorities. Uh, does anybody else want to weigh in on that um, about um, increasing communication from the individual and working on that side rather than the employee side or the community side? as I fight my mute button. So <laughs> what, I've, what I've seen in, in supporting people in the work environment is you just come to understand what someone's saying when you spend time with them. For instance, I have a good friend. He doesn't use formal language to communicate and every now and then he gets really, really upset when things change in his world and he has to ask for a break and when he first starts working at a place, it takes the job coach to point out to the, the new um, co-workers that that is him saying, you better just let him go out back and sit down for a few minutes and, and, and cool off. And after a while, it, it doesn't take a, a special device or, or a, a special, you know, card given to somebody saying, I need a break. It's, you begin to know the person. Um, but there is with, with all of us, when, when you start in a new relationship, whether it be work or friends, you, you begin to, to realize what someone's saying without their words and without, um, you just begin to, to know the other person. And I've seen that grow into some really good relationships that, that are supportive of each other. And, and that's when I think community blossoms and, and things begin to really work. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? I, I want to just continue on with that one, that, that um, point that you made there, Stacey. Um, what can the people do to support their family member, their um, clients, their students, or others on the spectrum to engage more fully in their communities? What, what's your advice to people that are trying to do that? Trying to help 
folks with autism engage in the, their communities? Be brave. <laughs> That's, I uh, just get out of your way. I, I I support families in understanding that we are taught to be the decision makers in our children's lives from a very early age, whether our, our children have a, a label of a disability or not. We are the decision makers. And somewhere along the way, when our children begin to grow, that they take away <laughs> that right of the parent because they're gonna do it their way. But not always with a son or daughter with a disability. Often the, the parent maintains that decision-making um, right or, or that skill. And when I start to, to support a, a parent to, to move out of that decision-making, and, and Jen, you already talked about this, but you move out of that decision-making role and you, you slowly become the consultant in that um, son or daughter's life, what I see is the son or daughter also, and Finn may or may not be able to support this, but the son or daughter with the disability needs those supports to realize, oh wait, <laughs> someone's not making the decisions for me anymore, and we have to support that person into moving into making um, informed choices, uh, you, you can call it supported decision making, to become the decision maker in their own lives. Um, I see a, a lot of that, and, and I've even had families come after, come out, I'll use the words come after me because my son will just take the public transit system and he may go north on, in Atlanta, it's MARTA, he may go north on MARTA when he meant to go south and I'll get a call of panic and have to go figure out where he is. And some families don't see me as being very, um, that that's positive parenting, but I see it as a dignity of risk and I would appreciate the same if I wanted to try new skills and experience my community, that someone would give me the dignity of risk that I could fail and learn from my failures. So I would say to families and to providers to allow for yourselves and for the people you support to experience the dignity of risk and be brave. That's great. Yeah, that, that, that term, the dignity of risk, I think explains a lot to um, the work we do here at the ICI. And I actually hadn't heard that term until I came to work here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a critical term when we talk about um, any individual that's sort of stuck in this uh, paternal um, yes. sort of ableism or paternalism that's, that's stuck in that, that field. Um, do any of others of you want to weigh in on that? Let's see what else we have here. Um, now let's talk about um, manage, time management. What's the best way to prioritize community life engagement in relation to paid work, family commitments, and other life obligations. Are there particular challenges around time management for people on the spectrum? Finn, do you want to? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, a lot of autistic people, me included, um, have difficulty with what's called executive functioning, which affects people's ability to organize and plan and schedule. And my time management is uh, questionable. Um, I'm able to manage because I'm often efficient in what I do, but that's the only reason why I'm often able to manage is because otherwise, if I weren't, um, I would be um, not, things would not have gone as well as they had um, if that weren't the case. I mean, I can, I can prioritize. Um, I do prioritize tasks, but um, sometimes it's hard for me to actually like parcel out time because you know, sometimes it's difficult for me to get up. Sometimes it's difficult for me to shift activities, which can affect people's um, 
which can affect people's executive functioning and affect their time management. They have a hard time going back and like going back to one activity to another, like going between something that requires very little energy to something that requires a lot of energy or a lot of um, a lot of um, like brain power that requires them to do things that are um, intrinsically more difficult. Um, so I think that's important. Again, um, as I said earlier, with things like taxes and employment skills, et cetera, to um, meaningfully engage autistic people um, and how to manage their time and, and do it in a way that doesn't focus on you are broken and we're going to fix you. It's more like this is a way like we want to help you do we want you to we want you to live the best life you can. We want you to be able to have this like be able to manage your schedule in a way that works for you that you know helps you in the workplace it helps you in um, interpersonal interpersonal relationships that allows you to participate in the community meaningfully and and sort of adapt what you do to fit people's um, ways of thinking for example um, I know visual schedules are used for some autistic people um, who don't really in who benefit from highly visual interpretations of time or other, you know, sort of abstract concepts. Whereas some other people might like kind of old fashioned and use like a day planner and some other people may use their phone. I mean, I use my phone and I have like appointments and stuff in my calendar. And that's usually how I remember like appointments, like doctor's appointments, things like that. So I think that it's, you know, yes, there is an issue around time management because Autism, like some other neurodevelopmental disabilities like ADHD, tends to come with things like executive functioning difficulties. Um, also, it looks like I have another question from a member. So I have a question in the chat. Um, uh, let's get back to that question. Does anybody else want to weigh in on the issue of time management and community life engagement? We will take that question, Finn. You have it right in front of you. I guess it says, for Finn, uh, youth that are turning 22 have a very, have very different interest for community engagement than younger or older people with autism. I've met people who are in that age range who want to be connected to nightlife, dancing, concerts. How can staff support transition age youth in connection with activities that they are genuinely interested in? Oh, Go ahead, Finn. take it away. This is an interesting one. Well, I am a total nerd, so this is not something <laughs> I would personally be interested in. Not at twenty <laughs> and not at almost thirty-two. But um, <laughs> but anyway, I guess you know, sort of the same principles would apply that I talked about earlier. Um, you know, talk to them about what they want, what they find difficult. You know, if they want to go to the club, if they want to, you know, hang out, like maybe, like you know, talk about strategies that they could use. If they get overloaded when they're at the club, like. Like maybe you want to go out on the dance floor for like 30 minutes and if you get overloaded, kind of like step out of the club or like step into like the bathroom or a quieter space, kind of unwind a little bit after you like, you know, been around all these people and there's all the loud music blaring and we've got like the bass boosters on and you've got people dancing everywhere, the smell of alcohol and, the, and like the clattering plates and glasses and there's all this noise. I mean, it may be a lot of fun, but you've got to, sometimes you have to disengage and like, and then like, how do you go back to the activity after you've kind of had some downtime and like the same goes for like a concert. Like now, like I like music, like, you know, I've, the, time, the times I've gone to a can uh, concert, which I probably can't on one hand, I've enjoyed it, but like it can be really loud. Like, so a strategy might be like, hey, if you want to go to a concert, like maybe you could have some downtime before, like take it easy for the rest of the day before you go to the concert and then after you go to the concert or bring earplugs to kind of, make the music less blare, like make the music blare a little bit less in your ears um, so that you still hear the music, but it's not like shattering your eardrums. So there are different ways that you can teach people or help people or kind of facilitate them in engaging in activities that other people their age might do, but um, taking into account um, sensory difficulties or social difficulties or just, you know, needing to recoup their energy. Let's, there's, I just have one final um, question that I have that we don't have much time to answer, but I think it's an important issue and it's the issue of reciprocity, about um, reciprocity being the directional point of um, people with disabilities, not just receiving services, but the con contribution that they can make 
in serving others. Um, does anyone want to just touch base on that issue? We have about one minute remaining. Um, who has something they want to share on the issue of reciprocity being a two-way street, obviously? Jen, it looks like you're getting ready. Well, I think that's um, an important, I guess from the standpoint of reciprocity, I would sort of circle back to the idea of volunteerism. We kind of talked about the downsides of volunteering <laughs> a little bit, but a, a big advantage of volunteering is that it is a way, volunteering or structured service work such as um, AmeriCorps and some of my colleagues have actually looked at people with disabilities participating in, in volunteer and service work and how that can be really an important way for them to make a contribution and feel like and sort of take on that role of helping others when sometimes the service systems or schools have led people with autism or other disabilities to sort of always feel like they're the recipients of help. Great. Well, um, I think our time has run out. Um, I want to thank the panelists uh, for joining us here today. Um, it's been an exciting and interesting conversation. Looking at community life engagement, what does that mean for individuals with autism and how can we um, encourage that? Um, I want to thank that the group from ICI, particularly Katie Allen, who has coordinated this particular episode and kept things together. There's also a crew which um, you folks online cannot see that are behind these screens keeping things running smoothly as possible. So I want to thank all of them and the efforts for the Institute of Community Inclusion for getting this together. And ultimately, I want to thank our panelists uh, for being part of this um, show today. We had Finn Gardner, who is a community educator, research advocate, and designer. Um, we had Stacy Ramirez, the executive director of the ARC in Georgia. Um, as proud supporter of People First. Dr. Jen Seleski, who is a senior research researcher here at the uh, Institute for Community Inclusion, who has been doing a lot of work around um, community life engagement. And Lauren Weaver, who works as a board certified behavior analyst in, in pediatrics and coordinator of the community engagement for Vanderbilt. Kennedy Centers for Treatment and Research Institute for Autism Spectrum Disorders. So thank you all for being here and thank the, um, I thank the audience. And I'm gonna turn this back to Katie Allen for some closing remarks. Thank you, Tom. Thanks again to all the panelists and to everyone who joined us today. So right now on your screen, I'm just sharing a link to our Facebook. So you can follow the Institute for Community Inclusion on Facebook and our Twitter link is also there. You can follow us on Twitter. And um, I've also put a link there to where the archives of our previous webinars are, as well as this webinar. It's being recorded, so it will be archived and posted there on the 50communityinclusion.org website. So you can you could rewatch it there or share it with your networks. Um, our next webinar in this series is about healthcare, and that will be on Tuesday, May 22nd, also at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you all again for joining, and have a wonderful rest of your week.